And with that, I'm going to turn over the introduction of today's topic and speaker to our guest moderator, Sudi. Thanks, Holly. Um, like Holly said, uh, my name is Sudi Thomas. I'm a wildlife biologist in South Carolina for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I just want to say a little bit about NRCS in case people aren't familiar. We are a federal agency operating under the umbrella of the USDA, the Department of Agriculture. We're one of the agencies charged with facilitating farm bill conservation programs. And these programs assist private landowners and other clients in conserving, restoring, and protecting natural resources. A few examples of the natural resources targeted for conservation are soils usually in ag agricultural settings, wetlands, and wildlife habitat. More recently, much focus has been turned towards beneficial insects. NRCS now emphasizes the protection of and habitat enhancement of beneficial insects through farm bill programs and conservation practices. In that effort, we work closely with the Xerces Society to promote beneficial practices, pursue further investigation into the potential impacts of conservation practices, and to educate landowners and the general public through workshops, publications, and training sessions like this one today. Um, so today I get to introduce Nancy Lee Adamson, who's going to be your presenter. She is a pollinator conservation specialist, and she really works double duty. She works jointly for the, the Uzerse Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and she also works with the NRCS East Nas National Technology Support Center. Um, so everyone is in for a treat because Nancy always presents a lot of useful in information about farming for beneficial insects. She has a lot of experience and knowledge on the subject, and you will see that she is pretty passionate about beneficial insects and pollinators. Um, I, have, I have had the pleasure of working with Nancy on workshops in South Carolina where I learned a lot. Um, so if you ever get the chance to get out in the field with her, you're going to learn a lot about insect ID, plant ID, and habitat enhancement. So here is Nancy on the subject of farming for beneficial insects and the conservation of native pollinators, predators, and parasitoids. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and I want to thank Holly for um, setting this up and for Sudi helping to moderate she has a big task trying to coordinate all the questions coming in. And um, um, anyway, everything she said about me in the field is true of her. If you go out in the field, you'll learn a ton. So thank you. All righty. Well, um, just uh, a little introduction to the Xerces Society. Xerces has been supporting insects and other invertebrates, which includes mollusks and crustaceans and other animals without backbones for 40 years. We take our name from the first butterfly to go extinct in the U.S. due to human activities, the Xerces blue butterfly. So we do all sorts of work to support invertebrates, but a big part of our work is pollinator conservation. And we work closely with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And thanks, Sudi, for that introduction to NRCS. Um, though USDA has always supported pollinator conservation, the 2008 Farm Bill responded to widespread concerns over pollinator declines, especially colony collapse disorder really brought home the pollinator and pollination crisis. So both farm bills, we don't have the 2013 quite yet, but um, hopefully it's also going to include uh, pollinators in all USDA conservation programs. So uh, May Spawn and Eric Mater, the heads of the Xerces Pollinator Program, recently reviewed NRCS programs that can be used to support pollinators. The program is a little bit longer, 90 minutes instead of 60 like today, and includes lots of details on plants. So even though it's oriented toward NRCS staff, I think it would be really valuable for anybody interested in habitat conservation. And there's several other webinars online. If you're interested in bees, um, there's one on common bees and best bee plants of the East. And I am in the East National Tech Center so for those of you in the Midwest and the Far West, um, this is slightly, my experience anyway, is more in the East, just so you know that. Um, <coughs> 
So the NRCS is able to help pollinators by providing habitat, um, providing for pollinators through habitat development and helping growers implement IPM practices. IPM is integrated pest management, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. I know most people are pretty aware of what that is. Um, but IPM helps reduce the need for and non-target impacts of pesticide applications. So these same practices are vital for supporting other beneficial insects, such as predators and parasitoids, that help control pests on crops. And um, we also call them natural enemies of pests. So wasps, spiders, some flies, beetles, and bugs are predators eating other in insects, and parasitoids are parasites that kill their hosts. We use the term parasitoid. Um, they are parasites, but most parasites don't kill their host. Uh, they tend to be much smaller, while many parasitoids are about the same size, size as their host. Um, and just one other little thing. Sometimes, so most of the day today, we'll be talking about beneficial insect plantings, but um, those are also called insectary plantings. Uh, today, we're taking a look at the value of diversity in agriculture and at beneficial arthropods and nematodes. So arthropods, um, te technically spiders aren't insects, so um, arthropods include spiders and insects. And um, then we'll take a look at ways to support them with habitat, food, shelter, and protection from pesticides. And um, we'll see how much time we have for establishment and, and long-term management, and then a little bit on additional resources. So biological farming is another name for sustainable farming. But the phrase biological reminds us to take advantage of natural processes and relationships to improve management. Um, so increasing diversity on a farm has a lot of associated benefits benefits, which include reduced herbicide use, lower pesticide use, and more nesting opportunities. We'll look at a few examples shortly of specific ways diverse habitat supports beneficial insects to improve farm production. Organic producers who tend to have diverse farms to begin with are required to enhance biodiversity on their farms. Adding pollinator and other, other beneficial insect habitat is a good way to add even more diversity and further promote ecological balance. Some farms may find that simply advertising no or reduced pesticide use and knowing their customers is as important as organic certification. In North Carolina and other states, departments of agriculture are encouraging communities to support local economies and farmers by buying locally grown produce. In tandem, agritourism helps people connect with farmers, understand why local produce can sometimes be more expensive, and perhaps increase their willingness to pay a little more up front. Though local produce prices may not be that different from produce shipped in. As a sustainable agriculture, oh, <clears throat> at a sustainable agriculture meeting in Virginia, a farmer shared his conviction with an audience filled with young people that this buy local movement was here to stay, not a short-lived trend, but part of increasing awareness that we all have a role in building strong local, local communities, communities that are more resili resilient through economically rough times. So field borders and hedgerows designed to support beneficial insects can also add flower power in terms of beautification and income from cut flowers or berries. Other benefits of plantings for beneficial insects include protecting watersheds and providing wildlife habitat, especially species needing open early successional habit habitat, many ground nesting uh, birds, grassland birds. The more diverse the planting, the greater the insect diversity, which means better diets for all sorts of wildlife. Though we'll be focusing on wild natural enemies and native pollinators, insects in general are vital to all of us. At the base of food chains, they sustain our ecosystems. How we treat insects has a direct impact on other wildlife, our watersheds, and our well-being. Insects are just as good a food source for other in insects as they are for birds, mammals, and other wildlife. As many of you know, these are cocoons of parasitic wasps 
that as larvae feed on the insides of this hornworm, they are nearly ready to emerge as adult wasps, tiny and ready to mate and lay eggs on other hornworm caterpillars. Taking advantage of relationships between pests and their natural enemies to improve farm productivity means rethinking insect control in any predator-prey system, whether it's wolves and rabbits or wasps and hornworms, if we wipe out both populations in one fell swoop, it takes predators a lot longer than pests to return to that ecosystem or agricultural field. Many, insects, in, many insecticides kill not only pests, but the predators and parasitoids that help control them. Adding field borders, diverse hedgerows, or leaving areas fallow, or maintaining natural areas close to farmland provides a refuge for beneficial insects when we we are so they have food resources and shelter when the crop site is barren and can recolonize the next crop that is planted. Conservation biological control is part of integrated pest management, and I talked about that a little bit. Managing farms in an integrated way to reduce pest pressure, monitoring levels of pests or pest damage, not just spraying on a set schedule regardless of pest's presence. Predators and parasitoids are sometimes called beneficial insects, sometimes natural enemies with pest, of pests implied, or biological control agents. Beneficial insects also include pollinators. Though many crops, crop pests are common among, across our landscapes, a lot of biological control is very regionally or locally specific. Extension is often the best source for locally relevant biocontrol bio information. And I've put up the e-extension website here, and that's kind of a, nat a national um, cooperative effort among extension across the country. And you can go there if you type in conservation biological control. It generally will bring up resources in your region. But also, each agricultural university has an integrated pest management program, and uh, so they're really the best source of what's currently uh, known. And there's lots of new research in this area. It's a really exciting part, etymology. And that's because of all the um, good things about reduced pesticide, lowering costs, and improving pest management. <clears throat> so biological control is not aimed at eliminating all pests, but maintaining a healthy ecosystem so pest pressure remains below economic thresholds. So even though you see insects in your field or in your garden, or you might see quite a bit of, of um, damage, for instance, to leaves, there's, um, there can be a good bit of herbivory sometimes without it actually affecting the production. And so in, in um, agricultural systems, uh, we've actually come up with economic thresholds to understand when is that insect damage reaching a level that's going to affect the bottom line or affect the harvest. And um, it's, it's actually surprising sometimes how much um, damage there can be without having an effect. So um, anyway, when we're talking about using biological control, it's just to slow pest population growth rates. So again, if both predator and prey are wiped out, it takes predators much longer to recover. Oops. I also wanted to mention that um, <coughs> Xerces Society uh, worked with NRCS to develop this conservation biological control tech note that will be out later this uh, summer. It's in draft form now, and there will be a webinar on August 29th that um, is highlighting integrated pest management and um, taking a closer look at this document itself. So tune in again. It'll be uh, on this same conservationwebinars.net website. So we have a pretty good idea of the value of natural enemies for crop production. But as you can see in this photo, and I don't know if maybe you can't see, it's so tiny, um, 
a lot of these parasitoids in particular are easy to miss. So the model tortoise beetle here is a sweet potato pest, smaller than the tip of my pinky. So this little wasp is pretty minute. As in any predator-prey system, pests repopulate a crop more quickly than predators. Spiders are generalists, are generalist predators. So um, in habitats without crop pests, pollinators make a good feast. Parasitoids are parasites that kill their hosts and are often specialists. So if you like that biological control agent terminology, you might call these special agents. Adult predatory wasps are omnivorous and catch prey to provide to their carnivorous young. She will lay one egg on this cicada after placing it in an underground nest. Parasitoid wasps lay their eggs on other insects, such as aphids. Their larvae hatch, eat their hosts, then pupate, usually killing their hosts. Some larger wasps are also parasitoids. Scaliaid wasps paralyze and lay eggs on white grubs, so June beetle or Japanese beetle larvae. But as adults, they consume pollen and nectar. Many parasitoid adults feed on nectar and pollen, though their young may specialize on, on certain species. This adult surfid fly is a bee mimic feeding on pollen. Its young, this little fly larva, smaller than the aphid it's eating, is a voracious predator. Flies overwinter in leaf litter or in the soil. So it's important to maintain undisturbed natural areas adjacent to farmland to support them. Many predator, predatory flies mimic bees. Though we know some fly bites are painful, flies don't have stingers. Prey may not expect what they see as a bee on a flower to be dangerous or aggressive. Beetles overwinter in leaf litter, soil, and rotting wood. So having some undisturbed natural areas near agricultural fields can help in maintaining populations. Um, yeah. So, oops. So they overwinter in leaf litter, soil, and rotting wood. So same story. And some natural areas uh, is really good support close to the farmland. So lace wings are predaceous as adults and larvae. And lace, lace wing larvae will eat one another. So lace wings have developed this um, stock for their eggs. And usually there's half a dozen or more in a row. Um, but, and they're usually not on the fruit. They're more likely to be found on the stem or the leaves. And um, so if the larvae hatches from that egg, it'll climb down the stalk, but it tends not to climb up the other stalks to eat the eggs. But if they were all um, sitting there, they would, they would eat them up. So here, the, gray swing, the green lacewing larva is eating white fly larvae, so just a, the right size. So it can be hard at first glance to distinguish a pest bug from a beneficial predator bug like this assassin bug. And until you start looking for predators or parasitoids, you may not notice them. So uh, it's really important to remember that if there are pests present, chances are there's going to be good predatory or parasitoid uh, uh, insects or other arthropods present as well. And um, habitat near crops provides harborage and food for, for predators and parasitoids when crops are harvested. So um, when we're talking about pollinators, most of those can fly in and out of the crop. If it's there, they can go fly someplace else. But uh, some of our predators, um, especially spiders, 
aren't, they can't fly around. So it's really important to have that habitat close by. Um, but besides habitat patches, maintaining soil health can also help reduce pest problems by supporting healthy plant growth and beneficial soil arthropods like nematodes. I guess they aren't arthropods. <laughs> They're in their own group, the nematoda. So nursery operations depend on beneficial nematodes sold commercially to manage fungus gnats and thrips. So this is um, one beneficial nematode that gets used quite a bit. So we'll take a few minutes to talk about the importance of pollinators and their habitat needs. Since our most important crop pollinators are bees, most of our pollinator work related to the farm bill is aimed at supporting bees. Native bees are vital for crop pollination. And here you can see examples of how many different species we've found. Um, but even though we've known how important they are for quite a long time, it, it wasn't really until the um, colony collapse disorder that we've realized that we really have to start supporting them, um, make a more of a concerted effort to support them. Um, and this research that came out in 2003 looked at the um, effects of native bees visiting crops versus honeybees. And they found that in 41 crops around the globe, wild pollinators, which mostly are native bees, significantly um, increased, increased production versus only 14% of crops with honeybee visits. So in those where fruit set was improved by both groups, wild and honeybees, Wild bees improve set twice as much as honeybees. And this isn't to diminish the importance of honeybees. We can't manage a lot of our other bees the same way. We can't bring in tens of thousands um, in a day to the crop. So it's really, so we're not um, diminishing the honeybees. But the reason that some of our other bees are more efficient has to do with the fact that many of them are solitary. So um, oftentimes honeybees specialize. If there are lots of sisters foraging, one group um, can just forage for nectar, and uh, other ones might just forage for pollen. And in this case, you can see the honeybee is collecting nectar from this apple flower. So she's not going to be particularly effective as an apple pollinator. Whereas the solitary bees, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, um, the, different, the different types of bees, but most of our bees aren't social. So every trip, they need to collect nectar and pollen. And so these two mining bees, or digger bees, are diving in through the top of the flower to get to the nectar, in this case. And in this case, she's gathering pollen. But in both cases, they're going to be a lot more efficient in terms of apple pollination. They're going to pick up a lot more pollen to carry to the next flower they visit. <laughs> Other reasons that um, behavior affects pollination are our wild bees, uh, our native bees in, in North America do what's called buzz pollination. And um, that's just vibrating the anthers of flowers to release pollen. And honeybees can vibrate their wing muscles, but not the right frequency to release pollen for those groups of flowers. Those are in the tomato, um, solanaceous family, and then nightshade group. Um, that's the same. And then also uh, ericaceous, the heath family. So um, Whole Foods Market staff decided to do a, a little demonstration of how important bees are for our food, and they took out 237 of 453 products, about 52% of the produce items normally sold at the store. So they removed things like apples and avocados, eggplants, and squash. And this is what the shelves look like after they removed that. So insects really matter. Uh, and um, despite our increased awareness of the importance of protecting pollinators, we've recently seen some terrible losses. Uh, in addition to the continued high losses of honeybees shown in this chart, 
uh, just last month in June, uh, about 37 million bees died in Ontario when corn coated in a neonicotinoid pesticide was planted. And uh, the first day of pollinator week in Portland, Oregon, um, trees in the parking lot of Target were sprayed uh, apparently off-label on linden trees so uh, for aphids, so really no need for any spray at all. Um, the aphids were not going to be hurting the linden. And they sprayed them when they were in flower. 50,000 bumblebees were killed. It, it, it's, um, we believe it's the biggest uh, mass killing of bumblebees um, that has been documented. So. You know, despite our tremendous understanding of the crisis, we're still seeing uh, terrible things happen like this. So um, it's not a time to be complacent about supporting pollinators. And I think people really are aware of these problems now and want to do things to help. So um, if people find out you've been listening to a beneficial insect talk or a pollinator talk, <laughs> They'll probably want to know what you learned, and um, so don't take take it for granted. So, how can we better support pollinators? Um, you know, uh, everything that we do to benefit our native bees and wild bees is going to benefit honeybees as well, and it'll also benefit all of those other beneficial insects we were talking about, predators and parasitoids. So um, sometimes I, I forget to mention that honeybees, um, the reason we talk about native bees or wild bees um, is that honeybees aren't actually native to North America. They, they were imported uh, during colonial times. And um, so we do have some other bees, some honeybees become feral. And then we also have a, a couple other species that aren't native that have naturalized. <coughs> but uh, most of our bees are native. And um, as I showed a little bit earlier, I guess on that earlier slide, um, we've got about 4,000 species of native bees. And um, the greatest diversity is in the southwest. So sorry to jump around there. Um, so we've got three groups of native bees based on nesting habitat habits. And uh, the reason we like to think about them in these terms is that uh, when we're trying to support habitat for native bees, then it's helpful to understand their nesting needs. They all need forage and nectar and protection from pesticides, but um, their habitat needs vary a little bit depending on their um, nesting habits. So the vast majority of our native bees are solitary. And that means that they don't work cooperatively. They don't have a queen with, <coughs> with daughters working together. They mate uh, when they emerge. And then the female will make her nest and <coughs> make nests for her young. Excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold. And then she'll collect nectar and pollen and provision it uh, on her own. And that's also one reason that they're particularly efficient because they only have a short time to do <coughs> to do that. So bumblebees are our social native bees, and um, they really love any habitat that would look like it would be good for mice. And they actually like to nest in abandoned mice burrows. <coughs> so um, besides providing forage, conserving brush piles and unmown areas is the best way to support bumblebees. And um, I usually tell farmers that if they have a messy corner on the farm, <coughs> maybe somebody's been bugging them to clean that up. All they need to do is add a sign saying pollinator habitat. And I, I really can't emphasize enough that those messy areas are, are really important for conservation. So. Um, <coughs> Usually, 
as long as people know that um, unmown areas are intentional, then they don't mind them. If they think it's just not cared for, then they might worry about it. And this is a big issue um, <coughs> I'm sorry. in terms of roadside management. Sorry about that. So um, let's see. Alrighty. So about 70% of our native bees are solitary ground nesting bees. And um, they're just, oh, excuse me. Hi, folks. I'm sorry. I am um, muting there a little bit to cough. <laughs> so um, our ground nesting bees nest in the ground. They excavate about one or two or three <clears throat> out west, maybe 10 or 15 feet into the ground. And their nests look a lot like ground beetle nests. But if it's a time when they're active, they're usually active for probably several weeks, maybe even um, a couple months. So if you just observe the holes, you'll be able to see the females will be in and out within a few minutes bringing provisions. And then about 30% of our, of our native bees are cavity nesters or tunnel nesters. And they depend on existing cavities mostly. You know, we have carpenter bees that will excavate nests and have big, strong jaws for that. But most of our cavity nesting bees depend on existing holes. So um, dead wood and um, wood boring insects, two things that we generally think of that we might not always want to have unless you're a birder, um, are really good for our native bees. <clears throat> so, um, Sudi, maybe this is a good time. If there are any questions, we could we could take a, a little break. Okay. So there's one question. So um, we're going to take more questions at the end. If other folks come up with some other questions, um, be sure and type them in. Um, but I have a question from Paul. Um, he's asking for a recommended ratio of bee habitat to cropland when you're creating or enhancing or setting aside such areas. There's some okay. <clears throat> so, Paul, this is what we're going to talk about um, amounts of habitat in the next section. So um, if you still have more specific que questions, um, let me know um, at the end, if that's okay. Yes. <clears throat> I just uh -huh. have one since you were talking about the different wasps and flies. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, I just, just from observing uh, pollinators, I used to look at what was a flower and say, oh, that's not a bee, that's, you know, that's just a wasp. But now, you know, now that I've learned all this about beneficial insects, I was just wondering if you assume that most of the wasps and flies are beneficial. Um, oh, um, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so in general, um, most wasps <coughs> are considered beneficial because they're, they're going after smaller insects and most of our pest species tend to be smaller insects and and then flies I don't know um, what percentage are considered beneficial um, yeah so that's a good question but you know if you're an ecologist you know that those flies are providing food for other wildlife too so um, in today's talk we're using the term beneficial pretty narrowly to refer to um, insects that are specifically beneficial for crop pests but um, in general, insects are vital for our ecosystems <coughs> overall. And um, so sometimes it, it's not always easy to um, label things as good or bad. Right. Well, then we had one more question since we're on the subject. Um, okay. We had yellow jackets. Yellow jackets move into the messy section of the field. Um, 
Are there ways we can get something else to move in? Oh, um, <clears throat> more of a yeah, huh. yeah. So yellow jackets. Um, not all wasps are social. Um, yellow jackets um, happen to be um, a social species, so they're actually still considered beneficial. The only time when, when you probably oh, think, <clears throat> when you probably um, need to worry about yellow jackets is if they're close to your house or if they're in your yard where you're mowing, and um, they just like bumblebees, they um, have annual colonies, so they start out with just one yellow jacket in the spring, and it's just by the end of summer that they have a colony that is worth defending. So they usually aren't aggressive until the end of summer. And um, so um, I guess um, if you really just don't like yellow jackets, that's probably not a satisfactory answer. But <laughs> but that's that's the story. So if you have more questions about that, just um, email me. And, um, so... All right. So we're, I think we'll go ahead and move on. Is that okay, Sudi? Fine. All righty. So um, <clears throat> insect diversity and abundance in crops depends on natural habitat on or close to the farm. So here is kind of a nice example. It's an apple orchard, and there's a mixture of grassy area and um, shrubs and trees. And so right now we're just seeing the... Um, a native rose is in flower, but I'm sure there's other things. But um, the nice thing about this habitat is um, it's diverse. So having as many different kinds of niches as possible, and then there happens to be more hedgerows in the background. So um, the diversity is really important. <coughs> So a big question, and this was Paul's question, how much habitat is needed? And um, it's really hard to say. Um, usually people, most farmers can't just take it out. Um, they, they end up usually planting in marginal areas. So, um, But in this particular study in Pennsylvania where they have very large apple orchards and they, they depend on honeybees, for a lot of their apple pollination, they looked at um, areas of the orchard that were um, adjacent to, they looked at the uh, poll poll who was pollinating apples in areas in the center of the those orchards that were farthest from the edge, <coughs> and um, which bees were pollinating in the areas closest to that edge habit and habitat, and they found that native bees really provided all the pollination service in the areas closest to the edge. So they were able to recommend to farmers, rather than putting honeybees in those edge areas, um, if they did feel like they needed to hire um, honeybees for pollination, that it was better to put those in the center of those large areas and then take advantage of the edge. So. Um, Part of the answer to that question is that um, bees, based on their size, they're, they're, the farther they have to travel, the more energy it's going to take. So um, there's at some point, it's not efficient for them to provision their nest if they have to travel too far. So um, um, the closer the crops are to the natural habitat, the more likely you're going to be have native bees visiting. <clears throat> and so sometimes we like to say within 500 feet is a good um, estimate. And then diverse habitat is this. <clears throat> so um, studies have looked at, um, you know, natural enemy and crop pollination by wild bees um, in different types of landscapes. And so the more diverse the habitat, and I mentioned this earlier, but if you're interested in looking at the research, we, I've included some references. So um, there's been some really terrific work by Glenn Tillman down in Georgia looking at using insect replantings, so benef providing uh, sources of nectar or pollen for insects is called an insect replanting um, versus a trap crop planting. Um, she also used trap crops, and so trap crops are when you plant a, trap, a crop 
to attract um, pest species away from the crop that you're trying to harvest for income. So it's a little bit different than um, an insectary where you're trying to invite beneficial insects um, or support them. But in any case, in her study, she looked at um, this little parasitoid wasp that infests the eggs of this um, green stink bug. And so um, by providing buckwheat as a source of nectar, uh, she had two and a half times the rate of parasitization of brown stink bugs, really dramatic um, effects. So here's the buckwheat, and here's a surfed fly. Um, I didn't have a picture of that wasp on the buckwheat. And if you wanted to um, look at some of her research, I included a link there. <coughs> so um, when she added milkweed as a, a source of nectar, looking at um, a different parasitoid, so this is a fly, Trichopoda, that um, she lays her eggs on the adults or on large nymphs, and then the larvae will burrow into the adult or nymph and um, eat it rather than the eggs. Um, so it's a little bit different way of parasitizing. When she added milkweed as a source of nectar, she had five times the rate of parasitization um, on the green stink bugs. So a really, really dramatic um, increase in parasitization with just the addition of cover crops. <coughs> Well, yeah. So um, a lot of times people say, well, if we're adding, if we're leaving these messy areas or we're planting these areas that may look messy to me, or um, <coughs> is that going to increase pest pressure? Are we going to have more pests coming in? And so um, studies have looked at this, and they found that natural enemy populations are higher and pest pressure is lower in complex patchy landscapes that have these type habitats, fallow fields, field margins, or wooded habitats, any kind of natural area adjacent to the farms. Uh, David Orr here in North Carolina did do some research looking at packaged uh, beneficial insect uh, mixes. You can get um, uh, mixes of plants that are specifically called beneficial insect mixes from um, organic seed companies and different companies. Sometimes they include um, a lot of annual species. Most of our NRCS plantings, we uh, perennial wildflowers, unless you're doing cover crops. But um, he did find that some of those mixes included um, evening primrose and that that did tend to invite um, uh, some moth species that were pests. And so he developed his own mixes that didn't include evening primrose. And um, one other issue um, is that depending on the farm system, certain uh, wildflowers that we might want to plant may already be very present in those areas, or they could present a problem um, as a pest plant. So just be aware when you're talking to the farmer or in, in a certain landscapes, uh, if any species tend to be more aggressive. Uh, sometimes that aggressiveness is good for establishment, but if it's also um, causing any kind of um, weed pests, then you don't want to use that plant. <coughs> So here's uh, the uh, study that looked at how much habitat is needed for beneficial insects, not just pollination, but parasitoids. Um, so in this uh, canola pest control study, when they had less than 20% of the land, so as long as 20% or more of the surrounding landscape was uh, a natural area, that they had adequate parasitization of their pests. So uh, notice that the threshold here wasn't 100% infestation or parasitization of the pest species. Just by having about a third of the pests infested or parasitized, that was adequate biological control. That meant that the threshold um, meant that um, 
harvesting the crop would still be profitable. <clears throat> so in general, bigger is better, but most farmers aren't going to be able to take out their best farmland to plant these habitats. So oftentimes we're just recommending planting areas um, that are marginal or um, instead of mowing the edges of farmland, letting things uh, grow up or um, incorporating hedgerows into um, your agricultural systems or your garden landscape. So providing habitat is not only just providing diversity and forage and good sources of nectar and pollen, it's also protection from pesticides. So sometimes people ask about planting these um, circular, circular irrigation systems. So they'll have little corners that would be good for pollinators. You could just leave those to grow up or enhance them with some pollinator plantings, but you just have to be aware if uh, pesticides are being sprayed on that crop, are those going to affect those patches? So if if pesticides are sprayed at a time when that when those areas aren't in flower, then that may not have a detrimental impact. You just have to be aware that if you are creating habitat, how is the adjacent farmland being managed? Is that going to support those insects? So um, I see it's already about 10 of. So I'm just going to go through some of this a little bit quickly. These materials are um, um, in a PDF uh, list of web links that I've put together for pollinator habitat. It does include some information on biological control. But this document is in that list, and it's available online. And it's looking at ways to reduce bee poisoning. And it's being uh, updated to include uh, some information on more native bees. So a big issue that people often um, are concerned about are neonicotinoids. And those are the ones that I talked about a little bit earlier. So I have a, a good bit more information about neonics. Um, if you download the slides, there's uh, text with all of these. And uh, the main thing <coughs> is that neonics are systemic insecticides. So that means that they're, they're taken up into the plant. They become part of the plant. So every part of the plant has these materials in it. So if bees are consuming nectar or pollen, if there's just a small amount of residue, it can still affect them. So large doses are lethal. But um, small doses do affect uh, foraging and other things, learning behavior. So these are things that we recommend avoiding application during or before bloom. Avoid repeated use. These have very long uh, life, so they might still be active after three years. The, um, so repeated use annually can really um, increase levels. And then. Um, do we really need to use these things uh, for getting rid of aphids on linden trees? I, I don't think so. So there's organizations like Bee City USA are trying to work with municipalities and um, communities to um, plant native plants and reduce pesticide use in areas where, um, where there's no agricultural need. So that's called cosmetic or ornamental use. And um, a lot of homeowners don't realize that uh, the products that they're buying have neonics in them. So uh, we have a report, and I, that is listed here. Uh, you can download that. That's also in that list of uh, web links that are provided with the uh, webinar. <coughs> and um, it has a, a, a look at what we know about neonicotinoids. So uh, working, I tend to work a lot with uh, sustainable or organic farmers, and there seems to be a little bit of disconnect. Sometimes people think that because it's organic that it's not toxic. And so um, this is a real 
place where um, an RCS staff can can help people remember that just because it's organic, it still is toxic to bees. Um, so, and there's lots of different options that people use to that are um, not really insecticides, but help control pest problems. So um, these are some things. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, so just for the sake of time, to so we can have a few more questions. And um, so the one thing for ground nesting bees, uh, a lot of organic farmers use tillage to help control weeds. And so we encourage them to just avoid deep tillage, reduce um, tillage as much as possible. But if you do need to till, if you can just do it lightly on the surface, then you're going to have much less of an impact on ground nesting bees. Lots of other alternatives. So I have a little section here on habitat. The main thing I want to uh, talk about is that um, bees in general have longer tongues than most of our flies and wasps. And so um, if you are interested in supporting beneficial insects, some of the plants like mountain mint that have smaller flowers are especially good for um, all insects. Bees love them too. And then uh, all the NRCS programs require plantings that include three plants in the, that bloom in the spring, three that bloom in summer, and three that bloom in fall. So we want to provide forage throughout the growing season. And then diversity um, just increases insect diversity. And that's good not only for other beneficial insects, but all wildlife. You're going to improve the diet of other critters. And then I have some establishment tips here. And you can read those later if you want to um, take a look at that. So the one thing people always are talking about, um, if you're supporting wildlife and these beneficial insects uh, are are the same. <clears throat> we we don't want to disturb. Once we have a, an established area, we have a managed natural area. We don't want to disturb any more than one third a year. But that can be hard in areas where there's high rainfall. So I um, try to encourage people to uh, not disturb any any one area at at one time. So you might mow one spot in the early spring and then another area a little bit later in spring. You probably don't want to mow during ground nesting bird season. So maybe, again, at the end of summer, <clears throat> some other little patch. So just spread out. If you need to mow every year due to equipment or um, just because you have really fast-growing trees, then um, spread out disturbance through the whole season. So again, we have this terrific conserving pollinators while addressing other resource concerns. That was the presentation that Mason and Eric did. Um, if you're more interested in learning more about NRCS programs, but it's a great program on habitat in general. Um, so I think it would be worthwhile even if you're just interested in, in habitat <coughs> for wildlife. But this is an example. NRCS uh, supports integrated pest management, and the practice they use is, is numbered 595. And so um, in order to learn more about this, you would want to visit your local district conservationist. And so just like Extension has extension agents, in um, NRCS, we, the, the local person that you would deal with is the district conservationist. And you could go to the main website to find out um, in your state and in your county, who is that person, and make an appointment with them to learn more about programs. Even if you don't need uh, financial assistance for any of our conservation, conservation programs, you can still get lots of really fantastic technical assistance. So um, these are some of the resources that you can get through USDA and RCS. And, um, I include links to this in the PDF web links that will be posted with the show. And then Xerces has a ton of uh, publications online. 
And then we have a whole website dedicated to conservation biocontrol. And um, so I've included that link here and on the PDF web links. So just remember, wildflower-rich habitats support beneficial insects and other wildlife. And um, we have a Bring Back the Pollinators campaign. And, and we have a pledge form. And the form um, just mentions all the basic things that people can do, plant habitat, avoid pesticide use, and then help spread the word. They can do that online um, <coughs> by, just by going to our website. So remember to plant flowers as native as possible and reduce pesticide use. So thank you all. I'm sorry to um, run out of time here, but if you are interested in asking some questions, we'll be here for another 10 or 15 minutes. And thank you, Holly and Sudi, so much. Um, there, as a couple of questions did come in, so um, you ready? OK. <laughs> um, so there was a question about herbicides. And if do you know if there are any um, no, uh, known herbicides that are det detrimental to pollinators or beneficial insects? Oh. Um. Let's see, I'm going to Can you hear me OK? I'm not using the headset. I'm using the speakerphone now. You're a little far away. OK, I'll use the headset. All righty. Um, so in terms of herbicides, um, we don't know that much about um, toxicity. Whoops, hello? Hey there. OK, can you hear me? Yes. OK. So um, mainly, you. You just want to follow the same principles. Um, if you are going to use herbicide, um, try to mow areas um, so there aren't things in flower when you're spraying. And um, we do know that a number of fungicides are are toxic to insects. And um, so you, you really want to try to avoid spraying fungicides when <coughs> insects are around as well or when things are in flower. Um, there was another question about the chemicals used to treat for mosquitoes. And yeah, OK. So um, we have a, a terrific um, publication online. If you go to our main website and you just search for mosquito management, um, we have some guidelines. but. Um, it really varies with what um, is being used. If they're using BT, there's a kind of, <coughs> um, well, actually, I'm not sure. If I'm getting mixed up with um, with um, gypsy moss spraying. So yeah, so I'm just going to refer you to our website. It's a terrific um, guide. So. Um. Another question about when you're establishing or promoting the, these um, native grass, I mean, these uh, pollinator habitat areas, are native grasses also beneficial to include in those mixes? What, what was the question? So our, how about, the question was whether or not to include native grasses when you're establishing wildflowers or, or protecting oh, okay. things, say, yeah. wild edges, like how they benefit. Yeah. So, um, most of the NRCS pollinator plantings include grasses. And um, um, in the past, a lot of the grassland plantings would include forbs. And it was about a 60% grasses to 40% forbs mix. And maybe we would kind of reverse that. Or having even just a third grasses would probably be enough. And we tend to recommend using the smaller stature grasses like little blue stem, side oats grama, um, things like that that aren't going to shade out the perennials as they're getting established. But yeah, you definitely want to include um, some native grasses in the mix. And um, over time, you might need to disc that to um, thin out the area if you want to encourage uh, nesting habitat for birds. <coughs> Um, in some of the, our publications in South Carolina, we include the fact that the native grasses are also host plants for some of the butterflies. Oh, right. And 
and that I guess they provide some structure, some cover, I guess. But, so another question is about artificial nest structures, bee boxes. Is there a recommendation of how many to install per acre? So in general, um, unless you're planning to actively manage bee boxes, we don't really encourage the use of bee boxes. If you if you want to have them, you know, so because it's fun to watch the bees, um, or it's at an educational center and you want to use it to help teach children, um, <coughs> that's fine. But <coughs> what happens if you have a lot of um, concentration of nest boxes, unless you're managing them well and carefully, then you're, you might, that might become a sink. You might actually be causing um, problems for the bees because diseases and pests will locate them over time and, um, and devastate those populations. But if you do want to have add nesting areas besides planting plants with pithy stems, um, or managing, you know, some open ground for ground nesting bees. You can make small bundles of um, bee nests using some native bamboo or um, uh, things that will disintegrate over time. So those don't really have to be managed. They're, they'll naturally decay, and you just put up new bundles periodically. But we do have a lot of um, specific information on nesting. If you are interested in that, <coughs> on our website, and um, I do include some links to that in the PDFs as well. Okay, here's a question um, about some of the states where there's really large row crop farms. Um, and the question was whether populations are better or worse in those areas, and if there are any kind of maps about like population maps. Mm. So I am not that familiar with the research that has looked at um, the impacts on that. I, I know there is some new work on that. But in general, <coughs> um, is the question? Uh, he's talking about um, row crop, it's mostly in these sort of row crop pollination, uh, row crops that really the, it's, they're more wind, populate, wind pollinated. Mm -hmm. If the question is, you know, all the herbicides that are used, or is it right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, because for instance, bees will collect pollen from corn, and if it's if it's toxic, yeah, we we don't have good data um, on that, as far as I know. Um, but um, that's a good question. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll if that person can write to me, I'll try to find some more. Um, details and um, let you know. Do you mind contacting me? Um, there's a couple of quick questions you might be able to answer quickly. Um, there's one about the medication used by beekeepers to control varroa mites. Does it reduce the immunity that honeybee that a honeybee has? Do you know, Nancy? I know what you're talking more about native bees. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the medication for varroa mites. Um, is is tough on uh, bees, um, so it can reduce the fecundity of queens, and um, so yeah, it, it needs to be used really judiciously and cautiously. And then one more quick question was about that specific canola study, and the question was whether whether that was an organic or conventional farm. Mm. That's a good question, and I don't know the answer, but I can look up the study and, and let you know. So if you can write to me, that would be good, so I know who is asking. I guess maybe we'll have a record of who sent the questions. Yes. Yeah, I think so. OK, so I can follow up with that, um, with those two questions. OK, and I think you pretty much answered most of the questions that were sent in. Um, either through a direct question or through your presentation, so I don't think it's 10 after. Okay. okay. Well, I'll chime in. Thank you very much, Nancy, for the great presentation, and I always uh, just personally enjoy your presentation and those that are provided by the Xerxes Society. The, the photos are just wonderful. 
Uh, no matter where you're, they're coming from, they're great photos, and we appreciate your effort in p pulling your uh, presentation together. And so thank you, Nancy, for your time. And also thank you, Sudi, for your time and being our guest moderator today for the East National Technology Support Court. Uh, we'll conclude the webinar at this time and look forward to your participation next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>